A deal has been reached at the Global Climate Conference COP28 in Dubai. After all-night talks, a new text was released in the early morning and approved just a few hours later. The agreement calls for transitioning away from all fossil fuels. Now, that includes coal, oil and gas. Several observers called that wording historic. Here's what the COP28 president, Sultan Ahmed al Jaba, had to say. It is a plan that is led by the science. It is a balanced plan that tackles emissions, bridges the gap on adaptation, reimagines global finance, and delivers on loss and damage. We have the basis to make transformational change happen. Let us finish what we have started. Hearing no objection, it is so decided. All right, let's get more from DW Climate reporter Tim Schauenberg, who is re uh, reporting from Dubai. Good to see you, Tim. Now, this is being called a historic deal by some. Is it, really? Well, it is for certain an historic deal or has at least uh, historic elements. For 30 years of uh, climate, change, uh, climate change conferences history, it was never possible to mention fossil fuels in a final agreement. And now parties have agreed to trans transition away from fossil fuels. So this is huge and this is indeed historic. Annalena Baerbock, Germany's foreign minister, said before we've been with one foot in the fossil fuel world and with one foot in the world of the renewables, now the end of the fossil fuel era has been decided. For two years ago, it was unimaginable to talk about, to negotiate about fossil fuels. This has been done here. This were hard battles. Uh, we saw that in the, in the past days. It was really emotional. But we also have to say those commitments are non-binding. So it really depends on leaders to go back home now and um, put into practice what they have decided here. Otherwise, it's an historic agreement on paper. Right, so this, is, this agreement is non-binding and, and, and talking about things practically, we're talking about a transition away from. So does this really mean the end of fossil fuels anytime soon? Well, definitely not. And here is the devil in the detail. Um, it mentions just to highlight some points, um, countries are required to transition away from fossil fuels according to their capacities. This is necessary as, yeah, as we know, countries in the world, for example, developing countries or vulnerable countries, countries have very different um, financial capacities. They are at very different um, points in their economic development, etc. But this also means they can adapt uh, their transition, energy transition to their, their needs, but this also means, okay, they might use uh, fossil fuels longer. Then it also mentions uh, natural gas as a transition energy, as a transition fuel. That means, okay, um, if a country wants to go towards renewables, shuts down a, a coal power plant, it can use natural gas, which is a fossil fuel, as a transition energy. And thirdly, there are exceptions, for example, for coal. We only speak from a coal phase down. And um, that was instead of transition away from coal, for example. And that was necessary as countries, powerful countries as India and China, for example, are still heavily invested in coal power. And they would probably not have agreed to, um, to a deal like that if, uh, if there were stronger language on, on coal here. Tim, thanks so much for that update. That's DW's Tim Schauenberg reporting from Dubai. And we're joined now by Claire Fison, who's the co-head of the climate policy team at Climate Analytics. That's a global climate science and policy institute. Ms. Fison, thanks so much for your time today. Um, we saw that the outcome at COP28 drew a standing ovation. Are you celebrating this deal? I think what we've seen here agreed in the past few hours is really a mixed bag. 
Uh, and I would note that there was an even bigger standing ovation for um, representatives from the small island developing states who made very clear that they're not happy with this deal. It's not gone far enough. It's not done what the science tells us needs to happen, which is very rapid reductions in fossil fuels starting immediately, a peak in greenhouse gas emissions before the middle of this decade. So they've really asked for more. They've asked for um, this process to um, protect their future. I think the, the, the view here is that this text takes the first steps towards that. Of course, it's, it is a, a key moment in history that we have for the first time acknowledged that we need to transition away from fossil fuels. Um, but there's also a, a lot of loopholes in the text. Um, for example, uh, mentions of carbon capture and storage and, and use of gas. Um, which the science shows very clearly cannot be relied upon in any large scale. They need to be on their way out as soon as possible. So you've made the point very clearly that this transition needs to happen quickly. If the world does, doesn't phase out fossil fuels completely, can we still somehow reach the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree centigrade warming limit? Uh, the science is very clear that in order to meet the 1.5 degree limit, uh, we would need to yeah, peak emissions very, very quickly. And that means getting out of fossil fuels very quickly. They make up 90 percent of current carbon dioxide emissions. So you can't cut emissions at the pace that you need to without getting out of fossil fuels. Um, but there is um, growing momentum of clean energy technologies, which are going to start cutting into fossil fuel demands, whether governments like it or not. Um, and there is, we have seen absolutely growing momentum here and political will to move away from fossil fuels. There's, I would say, a small minority of governments who are really pushing against language for a fossil fuel phase out. Um, but the market speaks for itself, the economics speak for themselves, that, the, that um, renewable energies are going to be taking over um, in the next couple of years. And, and we will start to see a, a decline unless governments really keep propping up the fossil fuel industry. Um, so we know that 1.5 is still, still possible. Um, but, yeah, we do need to take, see governments taking the necessary steps to get there. We know that finding consensus um, is never easy at these climate conferences. Do you think global climate conferences like this are the right way to, to cut, curtail the impact of climate change? I think they're a critical part of the process. What you have in these processes is the most vulnerable countries sitting face to face with the wealthiest countries, the major emitters, the countries that are really causing the problem and have the biggest capacity to address the problem. And it's so important to have that face to face dialogue to give a voice to those most vulnerable countries. Um, but these processes really set the baseline. They set the kind of the minimum level of what, what we all collectively agree to do. What we need is then leaders to come forward and push further. So we need, we've heard a lot of governments in the room, even some surprising governments like Australia, for example, has been saying they support a fossil fuel phase out. We need to see um, all governments uh, going back home and looking at their national policies and targets and thinking very carefully about how they're going to move faster to protect those most vulnerable countries who've, who've yeah, led a resounding call here for more action. All right. Claire Fison from Climate Analytics, thank you so much for your analysis today.